My name's Erin Baxter. I am a, a, a temp curator in the Department of Anthropology, and I just wanted to say thanks to all for coming. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Lieutenant Wilson within, this is a project that was the help of a number of people who are in the room, including Amy Gillespie and Michelle Kuhn, so thanks to them in advance. And I just want to start off by saying this was a really incredible project. I am the daughter of, a, of an Air Force veteran, and my two uncles were in the were in the Air Force in Vietnam, and this was a project that was important for a lot of reasons, and I'd love to share it with you. We've got about a half an hour, 20 minutes, something like that, and then I will do it for questions. Um, so this was a project that was in collaboration with Colorado State University, the Department of Defense Accounting Agency, uh, CIMIL, which is in military lands, and then DMNS. And um, a word on full disclosure is that I'm not going to tell you uh, what we found with respect to human remains. I'm just not going to say it because whatever we did or didn't find needs to be sent through and um, DNA sort of things needs to happen, and the family needs to be uh, notified first. But I'm going to talk about everything else related to the history of Lieutenant Wilson, the Eighth Army, the the project that we're working on, the methods of archaeology, and the methods of recovery. So all but, but that's the full thing. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, which you're used to with archaeology and paleontology, right? Um, I would just like to say that I am a desert rat. My training is in southwestern archaeology, and I would like to say working in northern France in the summer was the wettest I have ever been, um, and horrible. And I would think the same is true for my colleagues who work in Meso, well, Amy, you might work, you might used to be more used to weather and um, desert, high deserts of Peru. Michelle had to adapt as well. Um, again, we worked for the Department of Defense Accounting Agency. This um, was an organization founded in 2015, and it used to be the POW MIA organization. And uh, with new fundings and sort of a new director, they actually reached out for. Um, uh, uh, partners to sort of help find this extraordinary number of missing service members. Um, and these are in uh, four wars, five wars now. Uh, most of them, a, a bulk are from World War II um, that are still in uh, search for. And um, what's sort of amazing about this is that um, DPA, is, it's, it goes through these sort of different levels of um, awareness by the American public. and. Uh, it was on an uptick a few years ago when DMNS got asked to work for them. But basically, it was um, the idea that we have just thousands of service members from Vietnam to Korea to, um, well, there's still actually some as far back as the Civil War that are still trying to be identified. And um, especially in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and in the, and the battlefields of the South Pacific and, um, and, and France, especially in Germany, that there are these members who are no longer extant. So the idea is to find them, identify them, uh, take DNA samplings, and repatriate them um, to wherever their family wishes to with honor. Um, and so that was the mission that we were asked to help with um, in the summer of 2021, and we were asked to help with finding this young man, Lieutenant, Lieutenant George, um, his nickname was Frankie Wilson Jr., who was born on November the 13th in 1921 in Ogden, Utah, and was just barely 23 and a half when he died on July the 8th of 1944. Um, but he has been missing uh, since that time, since he flew over France. Um, and this is where the area where we think that he went down. It's a little town called Manchi Caillou, population 491. Is that right, Amy? Uh, something like that. I, actually, I think, I, that's, I think that's a lie. I think it has to be a, a third of that. Um, but it's, and he flew um, a B-17 bomber pilot. He was on his third mission when he was shot down. And this is his air crew and the craft that we were actually looking for. Um, so all of these men, with the exception of the guy on the top right, were on the plane. Um, all of them but Frankie were able to bail out. One was, um, one was smuggled out by the French resistance. The rest were captured and spent the duration of the war in a prison camp. But Frankie is on the lower left. And it's his story that I'd like to tell you a little bit about today. Um, but the idea of a B-17 bomber actually goes back to... Um, before the First World War when a projection of force was such an important sort of element of warfare. Trench warfare, the tactics did never exceeded the technology that was associated with it. And that's why there were such ex horrific casualties in that war. And that's why military scientists were trying to figure out a way to, to overcome the, the absolute um, dre dre toil and drudgery and horror of, of, of trench warfare. And they did so by projection of force in airplanes. And this began to be developed in the 1920s. Um, the US put significant amounts of money into its development, these long range bombers that were, would fly slow and high and decimate and go behind enemy lines so that you didn't have to march an army into an, an, uh, a, an opposing capital or town, but that you could just drop your bombs there and the army could come secondarily. And it was meant to save lives, believe it or not. A questionable sort of tactic, but the idea was that it, 
that it did so, but it was 31 meters wide, 22 meters long, 10 meters high. It could go 2,300 kilometers, far outstripping air, um, any sort of smaller uh, fighter pilots. It could carry 8,000 pounds of bombs and about nine guys. Um, and it was, yeah, and it was extraordinary sort of piece of technology, and it was also a really efficient piece of technology that Actually, the, the guys loved the B-17 bombers more than the B-24s or the B-24 Liberators because of its simplicity and because it could sustain so much damage because there were like three wires and a, and a strut on it. It was really <laughs> stripped out. I mean, it really, it really was um, simple and efficient and, and, um, and effective. Um, so there, I think I have, yes, there were lots of top turrets and waste gun. Oh, there's talking. I thought the sound didn't work, so I was going to talk over it. But anyway, there's, uh, there's talking. You can turn it off, Ben. I'll, I'll, I'll make it up. I sound like a narrator, don't I? Chipmunk on speed. Right, right. Um, but, uh, but there's some statistics. that, and You might have, might have watched Masters of the Air on HBO lately, but there's some statistics that more men died flying in the 8th Air Force than died in all of... Um, of the Marines from, you know, from Guadalcanal to Iwo Jima. And that's a grim statistic. I'm not, that's not, it's not a good comparison, but to give you an idea of just how deadly and, and um, it was to fly in the 8th Air Force because they were flying over Germany in 1942 and 1943 before the Blitz, and their, their casualties were just unheard of. Um, they threw, they, this, meant, this is how many men flew, and um, 3 million missions. Uh, more than 1 million Germans manned 40,000 guns that were meant to bring them down. So the casualty rate was, was really, really quite high. And that's why there are stories of played things like the Memphis Bell, who did 25 missions and was able to, were able to come home because the casualty rate was so high. That, that was a really, really rare occurrence for those uh, people to come back. Um, but I want to tell the story of Frankie. He is center to all of this. Again, he was um, a very cute young man born in Utah. Um, he had a little uh, sister who was about um, 16 months older than he named Jenny, who just passed away, well, just, she passed away in 2005 in Salt Lake City. Um, and there are stories, she would tell stories. She said she thought of him every day of his life. Oh, this isn't plain. Um, when he was, uh, uh, because they were best friends at, growing up, because they were a little bit of military brats and they sort of moved around. Um, there's, uh, I know Frankie's mother was really devoted to him because she spent years after his death trying to find the box of his personal effects that had been lost in the, in the, after, the, after his death in, in 1944. There's his mother. He had a son named Terry who just passed away in 2017 um, who looked exactly like him. And so he signed up in 1942 when he became old enough to sort of do it and went through OCS. Um, there's his mom and dad. His, his dad passed away in 1956. And there is Frankie with his son, Terry. And there's Terry as a 16-year-old. And they're just, they're just twins. Um, so um, in 2017 and 2018, Frankie's grand step-nephew, please don't ask me to get, tell you how that was related, who is a military man himself, decided that he had heard the story of Frankie, his wife's great uncle. Did you see how I did there? Um, and, uh, and basically decided he wanted to go back and find Frankie because the Department of uh, uh, Defense had sort of determined him unrecoverable. And so he decided to go through family records, through oral history, and he went back sort of through things and basically decided to go to France of his own, on his own dime and find this field based upon these really scant records that were left by the military to see if he could figure out where he, um, he might have crashed. And he met with locals. Um, these are a number of people that we got to work with in France, but this is a few years before we got there. You can see that this is a, a, a field that's under, currently under cultivation. And um, it was, yes, yeah, there were lots of oral history related to it. This is a lovely form of wheat. That wasn't there when we got there. No, no, we had a totally different kind of crop that we had to deal with. Uh, but these guys did, and there's Sonny Bornemeyer, he's the Frankie's grand step nephew, um, uh, who, is, who sort of fielded this, and they did find pieces of an aircraft. Pieces of an aircraft in World War II in the Western France, not an uncommon sort of phenomenon, but he lobbied Orrin Hatch, the U senator from Utah, and they put that to the top of the list. So we got to come in and work with, um, this is what they found, and we, we got our museum got contracted to sort of help um, with this recovery effort. So this is the field of, of, of in question. Um, it's lovely. There's, um, it's hard to see, but there's actually, like there's a castle over here. The Battle of Agincourt was right over there. Um, there are bomb craters here, and up here are V1 rocket sites. Um, so it's just this picturesque little place, but it's seen 
And we were, I think we found like upper Paleolithic stuff there. So we've seen 40,000 years of history in this field, essentially, which was an extraordinary place to work. But if we wanted to zoom out, the 8th Air Force is like this incredible sort of bit of history because it went from non-existence in 1930 to a whole Air Force um, that was ac actually covered by significant numbers of people. And each Air Force was sort of like, I can't remember, but the first Air Force, which is, which is like stationed in uh, the Philippines, and the second Air Force is stationed in somewhere in South America. So it was the eighth Air Force that was assigned to Europe, and it was the one that um, was run by Hap Arnold, and it grew to such size and such rapidity that it was actually had something like 52 generals, 33 of whom were actually injured in action. They were that, um, they were that active. And then um, unbelievable amounts of colonels and majors, and they, they came up with all of this. So in about 10 years, they were able to create a whole different type of army, separate from, um, the, it was the armed air forces, and separate from uh, the army. And it was a logistical extraordinary sort of endeavor. And if you read any books about this, 90% of what the book's history are, are the bureaucratic sort of um, problems that they overcame um, in an effort to sort of make this possible. And then we've got the first, second, third, and then the eighth, which is the one that we're talking about. And that's the one that really sort of um, was the most decorated, the most bloodied, the most active of all of, our, of the Air Forces during the war and since then. And these are the kinds of planes. They were heavy, they were light, they were fighters, they were bombers. Um, but the ones that we're going to talk about mostly is the B-17 bomber on which Frankie and his crew was there. To give you an idea of how decorated they were, um, this isn't about two and a half years of, of warfare that this is what they achieved. Um, and, okay, yes, so here's the B-17, right? This is the sound. Just kidding, no sound. Okay, um, but basically, oh, there's sound, I can stop. German fighters and anti-aircraft guns wreaked havoc with the bombers. Flak, or anti-aircraft fire, was a nightmare that affected almost every bomber in World War II. These were rounds that would explode near a bomber, throwing pieces of shrapnel at them. Bombers could take evasive maneuvers, but at times it was so thick they just had to fly through it. To combat the enemy fighters, the B-17 had nine machine gun positions. These bombers often flew in large groups that were escorted by American fire planes. Um, that was um, mostly a deterrent. Um, I think in the course of the 8th Army's efforts, they shot down about eight or nine fighters in the, in the few weeks that they were there. They said it was just impossible. It was like, you know, trying to shoot a, a, an ant at a thousand yards with a pea shooter. It was just really difficult to do. Um, but Flack, and I, oh, I was practiced the, uh, practice the pronunciation and I did write it down. FLAC stands for <coughs> Flieger Abwehrkanone, um, which is a, means anti-aircraft weaponry in, in German. And this is what was responsible for more deaths, aside from fighters, um, of these men who were flying over Europe. And these were basically sort of shells that would be um, gauged on or about, they didn't have to be a direct hit, and they would come up and they would explode and they would rain flak into these planes. And that's probably what killed um, Frankie. That's what his co-pilot said was the, one, the thing that sort of hit him. So the plane was hit, but he was hit and mortally wounded um, at the time. And there's all kinds of uh, cameras associated with these planes. So they would have like planes, uh, they would have cameras attached to the front of the plane. And there were 13 um, cameras on the day that Frankie um, was shot down, but the three planes who had the cameras, all three of them were shot down. So we don't have those sorts of information, but you can see how um, you bail, there, there are parachutes, those are parachutes coming out of, of planes that are, that are shot down. So these are people who are surviving. But you're also flying at between uh, 22 and 40,000 feet was the ceilings for these, uh, these planes. And um, it's anywhere from minus 20 to minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. You have no oxygen. You're tumbling through space. It's really a, just a really deadly environment to work in. Um, the military had to bring in nurses from Alaska to treat hypothermia and frostbite. Uh, for these men who were stationed um, in England, and that was kind of an extraordinary thing as well. Uh, but there is, there's tons of footage for, from this sort of uh, area and this time. Um, okay, that's enough of that. Um, and they, again, I was telling you they were really, really kind of um, robust planes. This is a fighter actually cut off almost 90% of the tail end of this all-American plane, and it landed. Um, so this is why these were such beloved uh, vessels. Um, but but they did suffer sort of tremendous casualties. Okay, so on July 8th, 1944, in um, the 398th Bomb Group, that's the, the, 
That was just the next in line, the one that Frankie was associated with. It was formed in 1943. To give you an idea, the Memphis Bell was the 98th bomb group. So that's how many were formed and were decimated, lost, reformed. Um, these, uh, these young men, and I'm going to say young men because I don't think any women were involved. They were at Eindhoven. They were at the Battle of the Bulge. They were um, in Operation Market Garden. Um, they ferried prisoners who were freed prisoners on the way home, and they were disbanded in 1945. Um, but they were based in Northumberland. They, uh, these were their sort of, this was their, their base where they lived. They, uh, excuse me, PG-13 things on the wall, but they're, they were called Hell from Heaven, <laughs> and that was their, their flag, their battle flag that was Hell from Heaven. And um, where they fit in the grand scheme of things was that on June the 6th, you all know what happened, that was D-Day, right? And these are maps. Uh, I took a picture of each map of the invasion of Normandy and how far inland uh, groups had advanced at this time. When Frankie and his crew was bombing, Lieutenant Wilson, I should say, they were way, way up here. Um, and there was, it, was, it was really deadly because they didn't have any ground support, they didn't have any air support, because it was all concentrated on invading France. But on June the 13th of that year, just about a week after, after Normandy was happening, these really, really deadly V-1 rockets were being launched from the area where we were working, from Manchi Caillou and other places, that were killing tens of thousands of people in London. And to keep the Brits sort of engaged in the, in the invasion of Normandy, there had to be some suppression efforts because 1.2 million um, structures and 22,100 people had been were being killed by these rockets. So Frankie and his crew were dispatched without air cover, without fighter uh, area, to go bomb this part of the area when the major battle was happening down here. If that had hadn't happened and they would have waited just a few more weeks, those V-1 rocket shot sites were overrun by, by Pershing, Patton, Patton and um, and taken out by the end of um, September. So it was just a matter of weeks, one way or the other, whether that would have ha had to have happened and that those deaths would have had to occur. But this is what was going on. So July the 8th, a couple days after Frankie was shot down right over here, the, we were, the, the US and combined forces were just still barely making inroads into Normandy. But these V-1 rockets were just nightmares. They were these rocket-propelled sort of um, bombs. And the RAF were so desperate, the Royal Air Force was so desperate to, to knock them out, they would actually fly planes next to them and try to bump them with their wing to be able to knock it off target and save civilians on the ground in England. So the bravery displayed by the, those folks was amazing. Um, but again, they were just these flying bombs that were really, really deadly. And, um, and w this was the area that we were working in. And I don't know if this wants to play. Oh. Um, And so these ramjet bombs were essentially just right up the road from us where we were working. So we went and visited them on sort of afternoons. So that's a long backstory to say when we got there to, in 2018, um, we didn't know what to expect. Again, desert rats, museum dwellers, a, a Peruvianist, a Mesoamericanist, and a Southwesternist going to work in France. <laughs> We overpacked. I swear that's not clothes. That's all equipment. Uh, but uh, and then we we partnered with guys who were in the military. So the conversations were kind of fun. And we had these these scary black vans that we would drive into Manchi Caillou. The V1 rocket, and I'll show you a video of it. We're right up here. Um, and then this is where the Simon and his and his crew and and Sonny think that um, it was found. And this is from 1944. And this is how unbelievably pockmarked that land was at the time of of destruction. Um, and we ended up, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, there's a whole thing. I just messed that up. Okay. Oh, I can't fast forward it. You've taken my computer. Um, ben, can you fast forward that at all? No, no. Okay. Um, you don't want to see these people again. <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. Um, but uh, so we had crews from, um, from, from Simmel, from, uh, from CSU, from DMNS, um, and then we had all kinds of like military people from who were stationed in and around France who would come. They actually got called back because while we were there, Afghanistan fell, and so um, we they were they were called off in the middle of the day. We had um, a, a, a relative of a former president came and helped with, along with side her daughter. Um, but here is the the. Did we get to this far? We get this far. So this is the field where we were working. And again, this is covered. You can see it's actually covered in what is known as rape weed, which is the worst plant ever covered in spiders. That's just basically what it was. And Michelle did a very good job of crawling under. Um, yeah, this is, it would just, it was just rough. And so 
Uh, we didn't know quite what to do, so we did some sort of early experiments with a, par a partial crew before all the students arrived. And we just basically smushed down a bunch of rape weed, uh, a size of about three or four rows of, of seats, and basically sort of tried to dig by hand um, this field, which was folly. Is that the word you would look for? Folly. I think that would be. But there were parts, like the neighbors would start bringing parts over almost immediately. The weather was always cooperative. It's, I was looking at the weather. It's like 40 and raining there today. Um, but so this was to give you an idea of this is the field and that is where our excavation unit was and then we had a total station set up up there. But this is just orthoscopic surgery writ large. It's just, it's just, it was just impossible. So we, we did a little um, excavation. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, and we basically, this dirt was so wet we had to actually uh, fill buckets of it and let it soak for a little while or dry out before we could screen it. Um, and this was the area we were working on. And by about day one, we knew that this was not the way to sort of excavate anything related to this. Um, it was just bad. So um, with that in mind, we decided to um, spend government money and buy the rape weed. And so that is what we did. Um, and yeah, I've never done this on archaeology. I don't know if you all have. Um, but basically, they just knocked down all the rape weed and allowed for our metal detectorists and our excavation units to sort of get in there and sort of get a sense of what it was. But to give you a scale again of what we're looking at, um, is someone telling me to shut up? That might be, yeah, OK. Um, but these are, these are sort of ex-military guys for the most part, and there's, and there are partners who would come out, and they would basically walk the whole length of this multiple acre field and flag every bit of metal that they came up with. Um, and they would dig it up, and then they would leave it on the surface. Then we would gather it at the end of the day, map it, photograph it, if it blew up, we, no, if it was thought to, I mean, we had to deal with, because it, it's, it's live ordinance and the like, um, that was complicated. But, uh, but again, we sort of had to get back to these guys and these guys' stories and where they sort of ended up. And um, to do this, and I'm only going to, I'm running long, so I'm just going to shut this up. But I decided I wanted to understand how they got shot down. And so I went to flak school, because all of these have been declassified as of 1974. No, 1985. Uh, but flak school uh, teaches bombers, and this is what they would have showed bomber pilots, how to avoid the flak that actually ended up killing them. And the mathematics and the science of it are great. And I'm only going to play this through one part that is surprising. Um, but essentially, it's this is showing sort of what to expect. So these are early. So Frankie would have wa watched this when he was stationed in Yuma in 1943 and in Minneapolis bef and before he went over to, the, uh, to England. He was only in England 31 days um, before, he, before he passed away. And he was only doing missions for 14 days. So he watched all of this film. He was trained to all these things. And there was still no avoiding sort of this deadly element of flak. So the, the, what this, what, and this is what is so interesting is that this wasn't done by hand. The, actually, the Germans had really sophisticated computer systems that would figure out, sight in where planes were, figure out their, uh, their, their uh, altitude, and then project a shell that was between 40 and 60 pounds into the air to, to, to take down these planes. But they had to account for that that shell only went about 1,000 feet per second. So if those planes are flying between 27 and 40,000 feet, you're shooting 27 seconds ahead of where you think they would be. So then they're teaching Frankie, OK, you can never fly in one direction for more than 27 seconds, or at one altitude for more than 27 seconds. And then by the end of the war, the sophistication of the guns and the sophistication of the bombing or the flak got so impressive that that, second, that was down to like eight or nine seconds. So the second they over entered France, they were having to maneuver almost every eight to 10 seconds in formation with guys 15 feet off their wings um, to sort of avoid this. And these were, these were these early computers. I mean, I, you hear about Enigma, you hear about all these other, other sorts of things. But these computers would cite them in. They would talk to each other. And then they would do these sort of um, isolated point fire. So they would make these boxes of death, is what the, the bomber pilot said they were. And they would just take out anything that was in that area. And, um, and that's what happened. So you can see that this, the mathematics of this were extraordinary and why these bombers hated cloud cover because it forced them down on the day he was shot down. They started out at 27,000 feet and they had to go to 24. Um, they hated um, these, these impl in gun emplacements because you can avoid one, but it's hard, much, much harder to avoid six. Um, and that's probably what happened um, to, to Frankie and his, and his crew. And I just want to, come on, get there. Oh, did, did you see that, was the cartoon already happened? Yeah. Did, OK, good. I was so intent. 
I was just like, they use cartoons in these sorts of things, and they were in every single one that were ducks being shot at. I don't, yeah, I don't know why. But this is the mission log. You can see this is on the day that he went down, and um, uh, it's the lead, uh, the lead group versus the high group, and those are two different groups. The lead group is the one that had the most casualties, and the red is where they were sort of hoping to go, and the blue is what they actually did. And they got lost, and they did circles, and they did all the things. They took off at 3.20 a.m. and circled for about three hours before everybody got up in the air and they were ready to go. And by about 7 o'clock in the morning, and you can see the times that are listed there, 6.55, they made their turn, and they got lost and had to do a loop for people to catch up. This is always a really bad thing to happen on a bombing run. And, um, and they basically, yeah, went all the way across like that, and they were shot down about two minutes before bombs away um, when they were trying to take out these V-1 rockets. Um, this is the formation they were in. Frankie's plane was the top left. Um, he was behind the two most experienced pilots because he was the least experienced pilot in the group. Um, this is where they were. Wilson, Peterson, Barry, and Thornton. All three of those planes were shot down. Um, Peterson made it back to, to, um, to England, but only, sorry, with only two of his, of his flight crew alive. Um, Barry had to ditch in the channel, and five guys were missing in action and still are to this day. Uh, two were injured, or, and two were brought in, but brought in deceased. So those three, three were just really decimated. And that's the sort of, the, they, they separate out, they go high, they low, they didn't have, um, they didn't have fighter escorts, so this was to break up fighter um, anti-aircraft and, 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 and anti-aircraft stuff. So, okay, I don't know why I gave you that again. Um, Anyway, those are the guns, and that's how big a shell that they could produce. It was something like three feet um, wide. And why did I have this again? <laughs> there might have been a reason. I don't know what it is. But Frankie was hit, uh, according to his co-pilot, they were hit in the left wing. Their oxygen went out. Their stabilizers went out. Their hydraulics went out. Frankie was hit uh, somewhere on his person and was deceased almost immediately, is what uh, everyone said. They pitched off to the left. Everybody bailed out of the plane, and all but one was captured. This would have been the order that they would have gone out. The pilot is the last to go. Um, this is not true. The co-pilot went out first. He was denigrated for that much later. Um, this is the, uh, the Frenchman who, who, who was able to save Reginald Ferguson, the tail gunner, who was the only one who sort of continued and did that, was able to fight after the war. Um, and, then, um, and then Frankie is the one who sort of ended up in that field and Reginald uh, safety. All the rest of them were captured. Uh, and we went through and we did lots of archival work. DCPA doesn't actually like us to do this uh, because they just wanted us to know what was in that field. But going through cemetery data, going through sort of history, going through the, the diaries of groups to understand that, you know, like just how things happened in the sketch maps of where um, Captain Barry ended up, the bodies were found, no news of the others. That was Lieutenant Wilson's plane. Um, then the navigators also sort of kept charge of things. Somebody in his plane had lost his glove and had frostbite by the time he got home. Um, so he wrote mostly about that, not about the three colleagues. Am I, do you have a question? And we're done. I'm done. I can't, I can't. Wow. Sorry, I just, I just, I looked it up because I was like, I think that's their plane and that note just came up. Wow, he was on that bombing run with Lieutenant Wilson then. Huh? Yeah. Wilson? Yep. Wilson. 398th, uh, 601st Bomb Group, Mission 4491. Ask me another number. Don't ask me any more numbers. <laughs> um, but anyway, we also did oral history. I think there's singing in French here. I'm going to try to see. Yeah, there might be. But I can't tell you how wonderful. I'm, I know I was fussing about the weather and the rape weed and the spiders. But every French person came to our project, it felt like. And they all brought wine and or bread. And um, <laughs> it was great. It was usually, for me, uh, field is slimming. It's the antithesis of that. Uh, the cows were mean to Michelle. But otherwise, we just, uh, it was just some... Drink, we never drank during working hours, um, and we took lots of we took lots of notes um, and lots of historical sort of accounts of things. And um, I got to be able to talk to all of these people about accounts of like where Frankie might be because there were some accounts that that some human remains might have been found and reinterred in other places that the Germans might have taken them. And all these little French schoolboys who were seven and twelve and nine at the time um, had different stories and different histories and they had different ideas of where the plane landed. Um, but we did our best with the materials that we had and 
it was a community effort and it was a collaboration. And here's what um, the, the, the um, metal detecting sort of discovered and here is sort of what the project sort of looked like for the most part, which was lots of labor, except that guy on the right would run a marathon at the end of work every day, and I hated him. Um, but it was, what we realized was that we couldn't do it by hand, and so we ended up getting mechanical sort of um, uh, means to sort of dig the, the site, and then we would screen the dirt, and that is what we did for all day, every day, um, from seven to three. And it was, it was onerous. And again, it was, um, it's a huge field. We only had sort of limited data. This had been plowed up and under for, for 80 years, as you know. And that's why that, um, those, those, um, the metal was just scattered all over the field. Um, but this saved us unbelievable amounts of work. And it would take about three days to screen a two by, or a four by four meter excavation unit. And it was just sweat. And there's Amy working. And, um, so we, had, we, we, we induced child labor. Those were the nearby kids who lived. Um, and again, we, just had lot, we did have lots of help. This would be sort of an average find for the day, would be uh, metal parts, un, indescribable metal parts. We didn't know what they were for the most part. Um, but again, this is the size of the field we're working in. So uh, for one, a couple of buckets to have that much metal, this plane is just all over the place. Um, so again, we're just putting little, little, little tiny holes uh, it, to find this sort of thing. And, it's a it's a it's a crapshoot, but um, we're doing the we're doing the best science we can, which is um, we didn't have ground penetrating radar, but we did have the metal detector, and, and that really sort of did help. And um, uh, we had a questionable help. Uh, I don't know why that kid sat in the bucket the whole time, but he seemed to. Um, <laughs> but yeah, get up, kid. We got work to do. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but anyway, it was a it was a it was a lovely sort of group effort. And this is like ten more seconds, and then I'm going to shut up. I promise. I, um, but uh, the, this is what we would normally find, and it, some of it was dangerous. Um, and so we did have, okay, uh, why did, sorry, mistake. Um, but we did, um, we did find sort of, you know, there was weaponry because the plane went down with 8,000 pounds of bomb and, and a full complement of um, 22 caliber weaponry. Um, we found struts and pieces, and then pieces that are probably more associated with an individual, so like medicine bottles and buttons and pieces of a parachute. We did find identifying stuff from the plane that we could match up with, um, uh, with serial numbers, and this was important because two planes were shot down in that vicinity on that day, and those little boys didn't know which was which, and so we were able to do it. We also had farm equipment and all sorts of things. This, I still have a scar from this. This is a battery that is still leaking acid. Didn't know that. Southwest archaeologist prehistory, not a thing. Uh, the police and the bomb squad came regularly to see that we were doing things okay, even though one of our unnamed colleagues did try to set off, I don't know what he was doing. Anyway, he was in the military, he thought it. And then sort of by the end of the day, um, we would put everything back. And so this was, this is what a typical day was like. Um, and this is how, how onerous the screening process was. And you can see the little bits of, of stuff uh, popping out of it. And then, okay, yeah, okay, it was filthy. There, we never had clean pants. We got in trouble at the hotel for tracking mud in every day, um, right? We did, yeah, I think so. And and then at the end of the day, we put everything back. I swear, this is done now. Um, so it was, yeah, we earned our we earned our keep. But um, results will be forthcoming. And the idea is is that at the end of of all of this work is that we will know one way or the other whether we were able to recover Lieutenant Wilson. His family will, of course, know first. Um, and the idea is, is that um, the artifacts associated will be analyzed. DNA from, uh, from family members will be taken, not just the stepson, so that it can be confirmed. Um, and uh, once that sort of DNA is, is confirmed, the idea is that, um, and they're still asking members like, Tiffany, you should probably get your DNA tested for whomever, if you have anybody who's missing. But the idea is, is that they'll be repatriated and reburied with honor. And, and that was the whole, okay, we got there? Project. We got it? DNA? Reburied? Shut up, Aaron. I went long. I'm sorry. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Anyway, so, yeah. Thank you. I think that's it, right? It should say thank you in a minute. So thank you. I'm done now. Um, uh, yes, next pop-up, if you'd like, um, is... If, I know many of you have to go to work. I apologize for going long. Um, the next pop-up, if you would like, is on June 13th at 2 p.m. I think it's me, and it will involve heads, which is my research. No, yes, it's heads. Is that okay?